Hi, welcome back. I'm trying to talk today about nature. One of the things in this new realist age is the uh, effort to make, uh, what should we say, realism the thing, right? And I remember having you talk, uh, having spoken to you about Degas comment about getting all the T's crossed. Now, in other words, getting all that realism and forgetting that isn't the point. And, uh, but then we have Ang talking about, yes, so then what was the point, right? Then we have Ang talking about nature. Nature is the source. And he does that beautiful painting of the uh, figure with the water coming out of the urn on her shoulder, uh, the source, you know, the idea of the, the source of the, of the living water, if you want to put it that way. Um, so nature is the source, but so what's the question, right? What's the question is, this, what's the source of what? And uh, so understand now that there are two different things in this world, and I'm just going to show you some pictures of uh, nature itself, some shots from around my yard, <laughs> my wife's garden, some of it. Um, but, uh, but understand that what we are doing with pictures is we are not doing nature, we're not doing realism, and to whatever extent we're doing storytelling for its own sake, we are illustrating a story or something like that. We're not, there's also something missing, right? And that is, so when you say, what is nature the source of? Well, sure, nature probably is the source of the stories too. So I won't, I won't walk away from that idea. <laughs> you know, love stories and all the rest. But, uh, but in reality, though, what we're talking about is in the, in the review of what the look of nature is, what nature is, what the appearances are, what we see, we find the stuff of beauty, the stuff that we love, we, the, the stuff that we want to bring home to somebody. And uh, so you could say, well, we want to just have a picture of our pet on our wall, but it's a minor mission compared to the, compared to the need to, of that pet, make something more worthy so the painting doesn't wind up in the basement rotting, you know, before too long. Um, I take that sort of position in regard to portraits. You don't really want the portrait just to be of somebody. You want it to be a beautiful picture. And so what is pictorial content winds up being the significant question, doesn't it? So I'm going to um, just begin a little review of nature. I haven't looked at this. I put these together quite a while ago and attempted this video unsuccessfully. <laughs> so I'm going to do that. And uh, since this is my question or my propo proposition, uh, I'm going to not have words up here this time. Won't that be different? Especially after the glossary version. By the way, do respond to the glossary uh, stuff, would you? Uh, put particular questions to me. Uh, anything, there are many, many words out there. Anything that we use, we use peculiarly, shall we say? And uh, so like many things, gradation, transition, gradations of value that produce the transitions on a wall or that produce form and all those things, it's common to everybody. Um, and uh, so uh, it's not like we're exclusive, but there's an, a significant element of what we are doing that is exclusive to us. And once you follow the glossary a while, you begin to realize that. And having realized that, once you get your head into that a little bit, you realize that you're getting your head into a mindset, into a way of thinking, which is why I did that glossary thing. Oh, before I go any further, Dr. Strange, thank you. Very, very nice donation. Much appreciated. And I appreciate your questions as well. I think we have one of yours coming up. I can't remember if I did. Did we just do one? I don't remember. Um, you know, you people aren't aren't paying for for responses from me. Don't don't think I think that, but I appreciate it. Whether you get responses or you don't, uh, that you um, or whether you send in questions that I take and turn it into a video or not, I really appreciate that. So many of you have actually donated in such a way that we can keep this going, at least from the point of view of paying my producer. So, uh, all right. So let's just look at some pictures here now, and um, I think you can. See in front of you the um, images, the, the little the, sort of the flowers. I think that one at the bottom is maybe a buttercup. The ones above peonies, maybe. And um, down on the right, there's some a form of viruses, Himalayan irises, or something like that. And there's some other sp stuff. I'm just going to talk to you about the stuff of nature. So, if we look at these, I've already told you what they're, they are. It's vegetation in a garden, and but vegetation in a garden is not pictorial stuff per se, right? So you'll notice one at the bottom. If you ignore the purples in there. It's kind of a busy, hectic thing, right? But it has this one thing that I would rather suggest, and that is texture. And texture, so texture is a pictorial concept. And you, textures play in pictures. They participate in visual ways. 
So, and it doesn't mean, so when you're thinking it's the grass, it's the grass. No, we think, pictorially, we think texture. So we're thinking busy areas and interplaying with other busy areas. Those, those are this pictorial content, that's pictorial interplay then. So once you see something like that, even purples, once you see purples, now there's an interplay between that and the green or that and other purples, if you follow me on that one. Even in that one, you can see the idea of form. The vegetation makes sort of, sort of formy round things. You know, I'm looking at the one down below. Let's see if I can get my laser popping for us. Uh, here, Mr. Laser, there you are. Hello. Uh, hiding out in the wings. So here's the, um, so here's that where I'm, where I'm talking about. So I'm saying that these bunches here could be said to be like my hand. You say it's a hand with fingers, but you can close a fist and all of a sudden it's a ball. And that's similar to what you're seeing here, a lot of that. And other sorts of things are here. Do you see the, the, the varying pointy, the, 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 the spears of these leaves? So that introduces the idea of shape, of a particular kind of shape, and so on. And that's kind of our world, right? Now, if you look at the one right above it, you can see when I talk about texture, that I mean that when we get into this, now this is, by the way, where we talk about atmosphere, because, and what happens typically in these areas, like this shadow area here, all the values become flat. Now, flatness is a thing, okay? Flatness is a visual phenomenon that we play with. And the relationships of flatness to flatness or the ability of the flat portions here to serve as foils for formy things. So this is flat, that's a form idea. And then this stuff is, is uh, uh, either suggesting a roundness or it's silhouetting nicely to suggest shape. Shape, here we are again with shape ideas. And... Um, and so on. So I, I, I think you're introduced to it now. Suppose I take this left one on the bottom where you have a, um, a um, actually, let's, yeah, let's do that one, where you have an, another relatively flat area, and that's really useful for this guy to pop out from or to get these silhouettes playing off of. These silhouettes wouldn't work anywhere near as well against a field of, of busynesses, right? Well, work well to do what? To play the shape games. And so the question is, and by the way, none of these look to me like really good pictures. The stuff is sort of placed in a pleasant way or something. But, but uh, and that's partly because these games haven't been played. This, the, the artist is not really involved yet. It's just nature. It's just a field full of possible possibilities, right? And then you'll move these plants around until you finally have a garden. Well, what are the plants for us pictorially? So here we have um, uh, color contrast, color value contrast. Uh, the um, uh, and the and and they and and we have spots, so the spots of yellow, right? So now we have size differences because these spots have size. We have size differences between these four, shall we say? Is there more? And this is oh, this is the littlest one. That's the biggest one. And there's some other travel. Then there's the distances between them. These are all things we play with. This is all the interplay stuff, right? So it's the sizes of units that are like each other and how much distance there is between them. And the timing, we say the timing between this, this, and this one is significant in the sense that you're trying to make it look good, to make it appear well. So you'll find that if you put this right in the middle over here, it will look more boring. It'll look like, you know, even. Well, when I say that, do you say I'm talking pictorial? I'm talking about where beauty comes from. So you start distributing these spots till they produce something, right? Something that's beyond just flowers. And that's sort of a spot distribution. So you can see the one above it. I didn't get into the shape thing, but here you have the shape thing here as well. Um, and I'll, that'll come up in another one. But so here again, you have the spot thing. Here you have a spot. Here you have another spot. This one doesn't read as well. Do you see that? So the relative contrast of an area sets up things, right? So this is the least reader. This is the strongest reader. And these other guys land in between. Well, that idea of the significance of the, of the contrast and the differences between the contrast, the interplay of contrast, and then again, of course, of sizes. So you have whatever sizes you have. These aren't all the same size, right? It's getting down to this one and that one being the smaller two. And if there are other dots out here, maybe that's a big set, you know, really, really traveling. So you can see the travel of the lights. Well, that's the pictorial stuff. That's, that's the delight. Do you do that well? Or do you just paint the flowers to look like flowers, right? So that's where a lot of you guys want to ask me when I talk about landscape, for example, how do you know when to move something? Well, this begins to give you an idea when to move something if you have a set and the set is inadequate. It doesn't aesthetically please. Now, it doesn't mean you want to change the world. It means you have to listen to see where the beauty lies essentially and what little thing you might adjust slightly. 
but that's the sort of thing you might be adjusting. The location of these guys in relation to each other, to each other, to each other as a set. Okay. Oh, here we have the shapey thing again. And you'll notice that this thing here picks up its own kind, right? I think there's one maybe way in the background there where there's some other ones that are rather like it. But so the, this is the like to like thing. So I think of these things frequently as things like these are sopranos or, or and these are the tenors or whatever, if you're playing or the different musical instruments. And but they all have their roles to play in relation to each other and their larger roles to play in relation to all the others and the whole. So if you begin to get an idea why nature isn't what we're doing in the sense of a flower, you begin to maybe be ready for impressionist thinking at large, right? And I am talking actually about purely visual beauty. I'm having a nervous glance at everything. It went way too easy today. I'm pretty sure I forgot to fix I didn't fix the sound, Mr. Producer. Uh, I think everything's going well. The day is changing on me, so I think my main light is suddenly becoming this, which may cause a problem for you, huh? Sorry about that, Mr. Producer. It was a beautiful light on my right side a minute ago. All right. Let's go down to the next slide. I say down. It's funny. Now, here you can see introduced the idea of uh, silhouette in two ways. And one is the what we call the positive shape. So the shape, see, the, see this, this stuff around here, around here, this is all silhouetting, and this is all the sort of concept of shape, shape or pattern. Shape, pattern, shape, pattern, right? Patterns, patterns tend to have clear shapes, the way we think of pattern as cutouts. And so, but you can look at the one below and you can see a cast shadow itself produces what we call patterns, right? So there's, uh, so there's big, big uh, uh, purple here and it has its own kinds of shapes. Now these are considerably more irregular feeling than these. And those are things of the visual impression. So they're pictorial things where you see the same thing repeated now, when you do, we find that when nature is most beautiful, it repeats something, but it doesn't monotonously repeat it. So these two are overlapping. This one is way under and it's behind this one. So you can see the timing between all these guys. You begin to see the interplay of like types, right? And so that's, that's just a lot of fun. Nature will teach you beauty uh, in the sense of the interrelationships and things, because you have nature just does random. It does everything, including beauty. So as Ang said once, you know, you can, you can paint that leg ugly if you want, but I see beauty but I'm going to paint the beauty, whatever, I see the beauty. Well, it's the same thing here, you know, um, there's a, uh, there, you're looking at nature with a view. Well, the, the reason you're even looking at it is because you've already found beauty, but you haven't identified it pictorially. You haven't figured out what you can transfer to your canvas and actually get that thing that you got from it. We talked before recently about the uh, trees. Trees are the types again. So here are these trees and uh, these, these, these tree verticals, these are what I call verticals, right? Or near verticals and they interplay. You can see the biggest one is here and it's complex. And there may be another big one way down there or whatever. And then you'll see the timing between all the other ones and the sizes and the tilt differences and all those things. And you can see this is a fairly boring one. This isn't that well designed nature. Now, you know, sometimes you can just move over if you're the viewer and find a better grouping or sometimes you'll just simply have to like Corot uh, move, move as, as some of you like to talk about, move some trees around. Purely a compositional question, by the way. If you can't, if you don't have the skill to do a likeness of what you see in front of you as it is, don't get too excited to do this moving trees around, okay? And I mean a likeness of the color and the color relations. There's things we learn, by the way, if you look in here. And again, we have the flatness thing, right? You see that there's some busyness underlying this. But it's all basically one big value, and it's setting off this secondary value, which the whole thing is setting off these brilliant spots, right? So that's, what is that? But distribution of effect. And um, so there's three levels of values there in the way that Sargent talks about it. And you could say four levels if you want to subdivide this and make this a different level from the larger dark and so on, right? And, you, well, in the end, you probably must. But, okay. Now, down in a spot like this, you can see this whole value is one, right? And this is a big, kind of a big, interesting question. This green and this are the same value, but they're not the same color. So we find in nature there's often interplay within values, coloristic interplay within values. And there's fun there, okay? There, there's, 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 there's some poetry there. There's some special things happening. That, 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 and so if you'll find a particular one someday, and you'll say, well, look at it, do that. Look at that amazing thing. So I'm going to just walk us back to Da Vinci for a second. 
Because Da Vinci, the analyst, tried to make a better likeness, uh, and therefore, having to, the, you, taking the mindset of the scientist, decided to analyze the visual impression. Probably there was conversation already. I've seen Masaccio really looks like he gets this in a practical way, but he doesn't. He's never put it into words, which therefore he's less powerful than a Da Vinci who begins to put this into words, and then the words plus the meaning give other people power. Phenomenally interesting the way that happens. And I am trying to do that with you to whatever extent I can. I'm, I'm not talking about originating ideas. I'm just talking about naming pigs, as we talked about last week in the glossary. So he, he evolves in a practical way, in a, in, a, in a disciplined way, the idea of the line of shadow. And he ideas the obscurity of the darks and the clarity of the lights with the idea of saying in the clear area, and we were taught this, in a clear area is where your form is. The shadows are for atmosphere. Uh, and we, I don't know that he would have used the word atmosphere, but the shadows are obscure. They're, they're fairly loose in their articulation of shape. Fairly loose, meaning not, not crisp in the edges typically, although they can be. If the values are close enough, it won't make much difference. And, uh, but you can see that he's done that. And then, there's a, and, then he's, and then somebody, and you can say him too, uh, is starting to find, well, here you could say even he is starting to find the idea of spotting of value units. So there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's four lights. This is a metal light. I wouldn't call that one of those lights. But at any, in any case, these four lights suddenly happen because we've been disciplined about losing the shadow side. So these lights now become the game, and he's done it very pleasantly, right? Now, you might, you might argue about whether or not these two sizes are the same too much the same. I don't think there's any issue that way if he's thinking purely visually. But this is the waking up of this kind of stuff that eventually leads to Velasquez. But here's Rembrandt making good use of this stuff. Here he puts the, his own face in the deep shadows and he's just doing obscure. He's obscuring himself. Isn't that a party? So this whole thing is a wonderful. Now that's the kind of stuff you say to yourself, oh, I just learned about this. How can I play with this? I just learned about the unity of shadows. And I'm looking in the mirror and I see this thing and I said, oh, Oh, that's fascinating and, and pictorially very interesting. And by the way, here again, you can look at a, a three-value system, this brightness, this one into this, if you want to call that a single value, and then this one here as the single dark. Now, you can break these up more, but I don't. It's, it's certainly not initially. It will be broken up more in nature, but I say you do that because it's the biggest thought you can have, and it's easy to see, one, two, three. Uh, now, you can say, well, it's not that easy, but it is that easy in one sense. It's just not... That's not the finessed version of it, but it's the big impression version of it. And again, you can see the story in a story way, then you'll see Caravaggio creating mystery in his pictures. Well, this is obviously creating mystery, but creating a, a sense of mystery by making his shadows, you know, uh, if not opaque, certainly flat, and, and really uh, dealing the, um, the uh, uh, um, uh, the viewer a, a treat in the sense of what da Vinci is doing, establishing lights and performing great stuff in these lights, and then and then reducing the shadows into these grand abstractions. Uh, so here again, that's the question, of, of course, is how much entertainment can you get out of just the idea of lost and found? And let's leave it at that. But these are the kinds of stuff you find in nature, and then we employ them, right? These are the we, these are visual phenomena that have pictorial, pictorial application. And I, uh, maybe the extreme example of it is the one right on the right above. This is Leslie Thompson, Boston School guy. But that's a, a fairly nice picture where you can really see him doing uh, Caravaggio. The upper lights, this thing up here, these are all lights from the shot we took. There was a chandelier hanging there. Nothing we could do anything about it. I probably should have blocked that out with, a, with my Photoshop or something. But in any case, what you can see here is now the entertainment value he's getting out of what happens in these lighted silhouettes. And um, this, you know, he takes you on a little ride between two or three or four lights. Each one of them is just as interesting as the last one in very different ways. And of course, the issue is too whether you have the spotting. You have to, you have major different sizes to all these things. Like just like classic pattern making one hundred and one in the Greek vases, you have different sizes. You have dis you have a, a distribution that pleases. And you have a huge variety of edges and things like that, uh, which is then part of the discussion is how, you know, so you have the sharper edges, this stuff here and this stuff here, playing off of whatever sharper ones you're finding anywhere else. And that's a set in itself. And you begin to realize that that's purely visual. That's no longer about the subject. It's now about the 
the uh, light effects, contrast, and inter interplay of such. Okay, so I hope this is coming across to you a little bit as the idea of what nature is and, and what pictorial stuff isn't is. All right, so you understand that we borrow these things, we get, we see these things in nature, and then we create with them. And the idea is, we, for example, you see patterns, and then you say, oh. I could make a better one than that, you know. <laughs> Meaning, now you're into the entertainment value, uh, visual entertainment value. I, don't, I show the one on the bottom right here because this is the classic flat area. The f we call flat, right? If you blur your eye, you'll see why I say that. This is all very low contrast. This is just again, this is a, a version of what uh, you see Da Vinci talking about, obscure in the shadows, uh, and um, and so lost. And so these are relatively lost, this chair lost into this area back here. And you can see the popping of the lights, the subsequent popping of the lights around. Uh, but that's just done in a way where you can see it. And you, you see these similar things are happening in some of these areas, but I just thought that was an amusing one, just since I'm shooting my yard. <laughs> um, now the one on the left you know, and this is the storytelling, again, the storytelling benefit of it. You can see the sense of mystery created by both of these things. So that thing, this sense of mystery is a visual production. Uh, Perhaps the first time Da Vinci did this, he didn't get a sense. I don't know if he didn't have a sense of mystery. It may have been just a scientific experiment, but he does have that famously mysterious uh, element to the uh, Mona Lisa. Uh, how much of it as a product of lost and found? It's an interesting question. But in this case, here is the Boccaccio poem being illustrated by John White Alexander. It gives you a, gives you a, 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 first of all, a party in terms of the, of, in terms of the line. I mean, this has now become a decorative, a really decorative treatment of certain visual things, certain visual abstractions. You can see the beauty of the long sweeping line. Now he's just making use of the silhouetting edge, right? He's, that's all he's doing that we found in nature. But now your job is once you see that is to employ it, that is say, get it to play to all the other ones of its kind. Much as you had tried to get the light spots like this and this to play, I'm talking about the white, like the cool whites, to get them to play to each other. That's the sort of game you're doing. Now we're doing a, a big black line silhouetting. We see silhouettes in nature all the time, like a tree. And now we're interplaying, we're finding the strings will do that. We'll do. So now you're just listening to what the other possibilities are. She's already wearing this stuff. You see a long line here. And of course, this I talk about this as the Art Nouveau kind of, kind of look. It was a very elegant line, very intriguing. I guess you could say sensual, but I, I think it's more than that. It's, it's, it's got an element of the beautiful that incorporates that sense, sense, sensory, uh, the curve, the, the, the sort of the, you know, the line of beauty, but a very different way of thinking about it than Hogarth. Um, now, so when you're out there in the woods, this one by, on the bottom by, um, by uh, Pleisner, you see that beautiful line? And now I'm going to talk about this line comes sweeping through here, right? That's a beautiful line that he found in nature. He put a frame around it. He said, let's place that beautiful line right there. And then let's play games with it. And so now you see him using this line here in a similar fashion. And you see him countering that long line with this interplay of these lines. They probably were all there. But did he then learn the idea of mainline counterline from that, right? So that's nature teaching. And you could say, well, you can get lucky once, but you're going to learn the lesson from these guys of what the possibilities are, what nature brings to us as a resource. And this is pictorial, this is pictorial quality, pictorial, this is stuff we look for. This is what you're seeing. What you're, what you're really seeing here is, is what I call visual music. And by the way, the idea of expression, you're looking at Claude Lorraine. Now here's, and, and it happens a number of times in, in Michelangelo and others, but the idea of, 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 of a grandeur that really that really shows, doesn't it? And frequently in Lorraine's pictures, Lorraine was a landscape painter that looks like he's probably the lead, in, well, he's probably the, the leading uh, influence on virtually everybody after him, uh, including even Corot. But uh, certainly you, you get to the Hudson River School in the US and this is one of those things, or, or who was our friend in, uh, in Australia, uh, New Zealand, where was that? Who also has this grand sense, the sense of grandeur that he produces of the land he was raised in there. Uh, Apologize, I can't remember that that gentleman's name. It was a good it was a good discussion, but what's happening here now? And by the way, you see this little rise here, this little hump thing. You see that is reproduced in type. That's a type. There's, so there's one, two, three of these vertical humps, if you want to call them that, or maybe even four if you want to count that one as one. But uh, so those are relational phenomena. So whenever any shape happens in nature, you, you expect a 
either have an opportunity to play. Well, how do painters talk? They say, if it's in the painting, then there's going to be a reason for it somewhere else in the painting, right? And that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. But scale is the thing I'm talking about now. And so there's this great sense of grandeur probably produced by the size of this in relation to the size of this. This is so small, so far away. And these guys appear so massive, but you can feel that sense of grandeur, which is not at all unusual in landscape painting. Hudson River School, uh, classic, classically good at it. So what did uh, Monet teach us, right? So you go into the broken color world, now he's exploring the range of colors and the idea of, of, um, of trying to make color be more true. And he finds himself using broken color for varieties of influences, from, from vari varieties of influences, and for uh, different reasons. But his main emphasis is on bringing the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the color, and you could argue the color of light, but it's the color of the day, right? And, it, and if you get the values of the color portion, the color value is what we always mean, right? But I could say color chroma value. That's the one item. Every item has value chroma, every item. So you see this thing up here, this in the corner of Monet, that's the lightest light in this picture. And you'd see somewhere else is the darkest dark. Maybe it's just here. And you're looking at these things. And those, so these are color values, but they're, but they're values. And then they're colors. And you can see this one, by the way, he's building it. He, ha he hits a note and he thinks it's purple. And then he says, it's not quite purple. Then he adds some green. He adds some gold to it until finally he finds that color note. And because it has texture, he can leave that color note broken. So he, you see him employing broken color. So he has intermittently the same kinds of notes. Like he has purples in here and here and here. You see that happening. And you'll see him picking up the same colors in various places. Hence the, definite, the, the way of discussing, discussing this that Paxton has, which is to, um, when you have a note in your hand, a brush, a color in your hand, make sure you look around to see where else you might employ it. When you have this in your hand, you might look around right there at the edge. You see that be you beginning to get that effect to work for you in its context. And then you might be looking around and wonder if it is that the same. And you'll explore with it and see if it is or isn't, right? And you may see it or you may not, or you see, may see a similar, a kindred type to it. So in any case, what we're talking about now is the inner relationship of color done from nature, learned from nature, right? And then you start finding beauties you've never seen before. And he's done this all thoroughly through his pictures. I don't know how much more I need to employ that. Uh, here's the idea of the pusher back just borrowed from nature. The idea of getting your eye to be here more than anything else by, by, by effect, effectively losing this or making, making the most greatest interest past this blob here. But that was found in nature. That's one of those things that was found in nature. Now, once you get glib at, at copying nature and you know that your job is to make pictures, to make us, to entertain us with the garden you're creating, then you'll start using this stuff. You'll start employing this data. And so, but if we just talked about the darks though, we would be able to see that dark is relating to this dark. And if you're a designer, you'll be wanting to know what these two have to do with each other that it, that is cohesive. Of course, remember the two things we're always doing in painting, in design, is, 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 is cohesion or unity and entertainment, which is that thing that is disunity, if you want to say it that way. So the entertainment value of a shape that does interesting things, and then the entertainment value of two shapes, one of which is maybe lumping up and the other one is dipping in or something. You could try things like that as your, as your base. Uh, now, so, um, and again, there's a variety of textures, uh, flatterish here, flatter in certain areas, and, uh, and most textured in other areas. And I'm talking about now that what we see is broken values. That's a phenomenon in nature that when you see broken values, you can actually use them to your benefit. You can play games by distribution. But it's an idea, it's just one, one more idea, right? So you see the distribution of greens throughout this picture, the interweaving to the idea of weaving. So pay, pay attention, we're gonna to get to Degas when we talked about all this stuff and how he pure, turns it purely visual. Uh, in any case, you can see it. Here is the spot thing. Remember the flowers at the very beginning here, the clouds spotting up. And the word spotting, by the way. So whenever I say to you that there's spotting, then the question is, is a painter been in the room doing the spotting? So is it beautiful? Because spotting is just a phenomenon in nature, actually the placement of clouds. but when you're designing, you want that phenomena to do something beautiful with the rest of the painting. And that's true of the distribution of golds or anything else you happen to see. So in this case here, we can maybe see these three pinkish areas, you know, or these several pinkish areas. You can see the, the inner relationship of those things. 
Now, his things are so beautiful in color as it is that you almost say, well, why isn't that good enough? Well, he undoubtedly lives out, looked through a viewfinder or chose or chose something to, to locate. Maybe he located this or just off center, but he chose something to locate to get his design going. And he probably chose the parameters. My guess is he did use a viewfinder. That's a question I actually don't know the answer to. No. Uh, but here's the guy using it pictorially. And this is, I'm telling you, what goes on in nature is men copy from nature. The realists, you guys are good for something, right? <laughs> You're good for, for sort, of, sort, of, sort of sorting out what nature does. But what we need is people who know how to put them into, into music, set them to music, right? So you're almost like a guy who's recording the sounds of birds, but you don't know what music is yet, right? So, but we know a lot about both because we've always had people throughout history who are playing the music game, maybe with poor drawing, and other people playing the likeness game, maybe with poor ideas, visual. So, um, in any case, you just, this is just raw entertainment, isn't it? Just look at the beauty of the entertainment produced just by the orange system. And you can do the same thing with all this. Look at the whites. And so I'm talking about spots, spotting again. These are just like the clouds or the flowers. Now, but this guy is making these pictures up out of his head, and he's now using nature's resources, right? Remember the trees we talked about, the intermittent trees. Now here he's doing a whole variety of different kinds of shapes, sometimes going this way, like this set, and maybe picking up again somewhere else, and other times going this way, and maybe picking up, or maybe just being one of several that begin to come this way, and maybe ultimately end up, end up what? Do we get three? One, two, <laughs> maybe. Anyway, we're talking about systems and sets and the timing between them, right? Systems and sets. Now, it's not of the legs of the horses. It's not what it is. It's the shape of these verticals, which you'd call tree trunks if you wanted to, and the inter interplay, the relationship, the sizes. These things all sit in a sort of a configuration where this is the lowest group, this is the upper, and then these are upper and higher. So there's a travel through the picture, sort of like the clouds of the Monet. So all these things, this is just use of vic uh, visual uh, pictorial stuff. Degas wasn't a fan of painting uh, from life. From, I mean, he drew and painted from life. I should never say that. But he wasn't a fan of the plein air painting. He, didn't, he actually didn't believe it was possible to get this. And you can see that actually what's happening with Degas, he's saying, this is what the form is. And uh, so he, he was a guy who was a, a, he was a top draftsman. Uh, and, and he could hit a note and all that sort of stuff. Nature wasn't the, his enemy. But, uh, but he never took that to be the thing. And then, as I said, outspokenly says, it's, nature is just the field. That's just the field from which we draw our resources. <laughs> Hear that. If you've never heard any more, you'd have to be leaving this, like, the, is the other shoe going to drop? What's the other shoe, right? Nature is the resource, semicolon, right? And so here you see the beauty of the intermittent oranges, interplay of oranges, and you see a relatively simple system of colors. Uh, and, the, and the idea of colors setting off colors, again, that's a thing that happens in nature. When you're standing, when you're, when you're posing a, a model and you don't try a variety of backgrounds for the model, you'll never find out what is the most beautiful setting for the portrait. You'll never find out what sets off the color most beautifully of your sitter. And you can paint dead heads all you want. I mean, but the point is, a picture is, needs to be beautiful in color. Human skin is beautiful if it's set right, if it's set off right. And then other times you can use it as one of the neutrals. It's not a, it's none, of, none of these things are rather a crime or anything. But, uh, but everything you see in Degas is borrowed from nature. The interplay that you find here. And he was, you know, I think he was, he said you can learn from anybody. Uh, you, you know, I'm tempted to say you could borrow from anybody, but maybe what's the difference? Uh, we better get going. We're going to run out of time here. This is already very long. Um, I'm just yelling, showing you sticks and the variety of uses of them. Here's my... Here's my uh, driveway, or piece of my driveway, and here you can see the variety of sticks. These are the legs of the horses by Degas. Now, these, this isn't as beautiful, right? But you can see some potentially interesting things, like the variety of these trees plugged together. These two big ones doing the same V, these complex ones, that could become a set, right? Big one, smaller one, but both being V complexities. Maybe there's, maybe there's going to be another one somewhere. Maybe there's a set of these that are resonating throughout the entire picture. The idea of weaving never goes away. The idea of a sound coming back again and hearing it again, it's just, in that sense, like poetry. Men, of course, to whatever extent I understand it, like music. And uh, then, of course, then you go look at a good painter. This is Millet, and you look at the tree play, and you have so much amazing beauty here. But just talk about that tree and why it's there. Well, you're looking at this tree for sure, and you begin to see other tilted sets, the tilted lines, right? They go this way, and you're interplaying with those. 
And that's going to be true of anybody who's got eyes. The visual interplay per shape, per angle, per gesture. All these things are things we find in nature. Even blobs, like funny blobs like this green blob here, that has a gesture, has a general gesture. Or this middle tone back here has a tilt. You see that tilt running across there? That's a gesture, right? And Or even the whole dark here. Do you see the gesture is rather up that way? For you guys who don't understand gesture, I'm just talking about complex masses that effectively are have a thrust to have a generalized unified angle. Most pictures have one. Uh, so here's a really delightful Pleisner where he's doing that as well, where he's uh, painting something like a, it's not a, something like a pier, I guess. But you can see him having this uh, sort of a grand sort of center of interest and this travel through by post, by post, by post. And you'll watch these posts playing to each other, both in distances and in shape play, shape variety, and of course in angle tilt and then size. So that's stuff that's just simply the artist beginning to use what he saw in nature. Okay, I could go on and on and on with Degas. I mean, the idea of, of uh, hidden things, you know, I don't know who first did that, but Degas just starts making hay with it. In this case here, he's showing this group of women at the museum. This is about Mary Cassatt. And he has them hidden behind this, this what appears to be maybe a doorway or a curtain. And then he has the woman in the foreground hiding the woman behind her, who's hiding the pictures. And this woman is hiding herself with her book <laughs> and her hands. And so it goes. And so he's taking these things and interplaying them as a hiding idea. <laughs> it's just crazy fun stuff, right? In this one over here, you see him doing form in a rather beautiful way, right? The interplay of form. So the form units, form units, form units. And there's delight in the interplay of form every place you do it. Or he could say he's taking busy areas. Now, here again, that just could be a landscape, right? Any old landscape. This could be a, some water with some marks in it, right? Uh, or the, we could talk about the interplay of blue. But this guy is just doing it systematically. It's all about... It's all about the interplay of stuff in a picture. And Gamble argued that his uh, color schemes weren't as complex as, as, uh, as uh, Veronese. And I'm not convinced that that's a, a good thing. I mean, it's just harder to control. So once you're into this world, and if you can control two or three or four major colors, you've done a, you're, you can see that he's doing amazingly beautiful things. This one at the Museum of the Fine Arts is excellent, just amazingly beautiful. And again, you get yourself into the idea of texture, and this, I mean, not texture, but of form. So this is like a tree trunk. This is undoubtedly just a painted tree, painted uh, for a prop. But you can look at the texture and the way it interplays with the dresses, the interplay of the same type of texture found in nature. So it's not about what you ha find in nature and whether you're skilled at producing it, it's whether you actually know how to play the games that they set up, whether you can recognize the games, which is what I'm trying to introduce you to. So... Uh, Yes, but you can easily see the interplay of, of curvy lines or of what we're calling these arm forms. But the interplay of all these things and the travel of them across, you know, across much like that picture by Pleissner with the road and the trees crossing it. Uh, so that's just, I'm just giving you the sort of 101 look at uh, the possibilities. Even in the cutout sort of world of, of Botticelli, you can see there's a search to try to get these guys to play together. I say these guys, obviously, they're, I think they're all women. So, um, uh, but even back here, you can see the interplay of reds, the interplay of reds, the, uh, what I mean to say is uh, um, the weaving, the reds, the blues. And then, by the way, this is a fairly simple world. Here's blue X, here's red Y, and there's yellow, the figures, the yellow Z. And that's a fairly simple world. But you can see him trying to employ similar kinds of things uh, and relational things. So you get a, so you get shape curiosity, and it's produced by a different, and it's and it's imitated or played up on a different shape. Um, I can't tell you this is the most elegant one of all of uh, Botticelli's, but uh, he does have a, a, a remarkable line. What was it that Da Vinci said about him, Botticelli? Oh, he could do anything, and I and I think he meant he could break any rule we know of and get away with it. He's got such a beauty to his, um, such an aesthetic to his mind. Uh, so I probably could say more there, but I see the same sort of cutouts. It's hard. I used to pick on that mentality of Mantegna being hard. Gamble loved Mantegna. And I said, but, it's, but he's so hard. And he said, what's, Gamble said, what, what's wrong with hard? <laughs> well, <laughs> hard can be beautiful too, right? So it's like, what's wrong with red as a picture? If you don't like reds, well, make it blue. What's wrong with blue? If, I, you, know, if you prefer yellow, I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of them. You know, they all need to be there. So, uh, but in this case, here's, um, here's Ogden Pleisner one more time, and you can see him making, making remarkable grace, not out of women, but out of boats, 
an interplay of grand scooping uh, arcs and interplay. You know, you can see all these things, marvelous things happening in this picture. All this stuff found in nature, but put to work, put to work in the cause of beauty and intrigue. And of course, all done with grand unity. Was there something else I was going to say here? This is a place where you can actually begin to see the pattern thing where you get all the cutouts in the cutout type picture. The patterning tends to be very important. And so you can see these are all these lights are cut out or the darks are all virtually cut out, meaning the outlines are, are sharp. But just look at the interplay of them. And this is, of course, another place to go. Just look at the interplay of darks to each other and to the whole. Uh, you probably want me to say something else, but this is, this is already running very long. So here's a picture you see. I'm showing you some stuff on my yard lawn. Trees, light coming down, casting shadows from trees. And you're getting that same silhouette in a Monet here. And he just happens to do it at multiple value levels, right? He does it one value here, two values here, and a third value here. You could say a fourth value contrast here, and then maybe a fifth one out here. So he's just playing this game over and over and over again. Um, and again, when you, your idea is when you see vertical lines, you don't recognize it as system vertical, vertical phenomena, these phenomena. When you see this, your job is to, when you see any note, your job of any shape, type, or anything, your job is to back up and see if you see it again because you won't understand it till you do. But you can see, again, he's playing this to this to this. And um, so, so it is with all the kind of stuff we do. Even if I talked about just the arc of this dark here, you'd see the arc of this dark if you're talking about arcs. And um, we can play many, many games. I'm just showing it to you again here, um, showing you how many times it shows up in nature, the silhouette idea. But it's, these aren't particularly interesting pictorially. This is really interesting pictorially, right? Now, that's just a question of finding this the viewing place or what? I don't know. Anyway, but when you get to this idea of the silhouette cutout, Degas, again, putting it to work like nobody maybe has ever done. Um, and I say with, with directness of approach. You know, his, he, his point was uh, to approach painting directly. And I think that m m might very well mean that he wanted you not to... Uh, not to just paint a nice picture and get it sort of fixed up a little bit, but he wanted you to actually attack the problem, make pattern into an intriguing thing. Let's have some real music from you and not just the sound of nature, right? So I'm just showing you these again because they give you an idea of what kind of stuff you can do with cutouts of various kinds, with silhouette patterning. Here's a middle tone on a dark. Here's a light on a grand middle tone. And here are lights in and around middle tone and dark. You can talk about the entire you know, play of these tones. But the idea of the distribution of spots, very similar, um, major masses. And you saw that tree, the trees I showed you a minute ago, they're big dark here. They still sort of break up a little bit, and then the bigger light is over there, that sort of thing. He does this over and over again. Here again, the bottom one, you can see him interplaying the, um, the um, colors, and the colors are picking up. This is all just learned from nature and from other artists who have themselves followed nature. So Ang is saying they basically follow the masters as they follow nature. Uh, now this is the form discussion, and I'm showing a Michelangelo, a Millet, and a, a Leighton, very profound use of form. You find form, but do you know how to play form and get the picture to go from more powerful forms to weaker ones as you get further away, or larger ones or more or stronger ones and the interplay of form winds up being a pictorial play idea um, uh, yeah and the relative you know you can do a portrait and have a, a you know if, if form is your the guy's head is really a form discussion and you see there's no end of music in it well that's a place to think here's the grand forms the subdivisions the the, the minor forms and then and, and then but is that a system to your mind are you looking for those as interplaying levels as I've said to you before, in the visual order, you talk about the majors, the strongest things you have. And uh, uh, they interplay with each other. The greens interplay with each other, the reds interplay with each other. And if you're into the game of, of visual music, into the game of the visual abstractions, uh, that's where you wind up. And this is where I wind up on this one. Remember, uh, nature is the source of picture uh, uh, gold, right? Pictorial pictorial, visual, pictorial entertainment. So when you see something in nature, don't run away and try to, and don't get your box out and start painting nature, except that you can study it. But try to understand, as you do anything else, even when you're painting a still life, try to understand what it is visually. Where's the beauty? Visual, right? 
And, it's, and it hits on many of the things I've talked about. All right, I'm out of here. That was very long. And I hope you guys who are lovers of long studies enjoy that. <laughs> Again, thank you, Dr. Strange, um, and for your lovely contribution there. Much, much appreciated. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all. Thank you all for your, for your uh, continuing commentary, um, uh, for your sharing, your... Uh, but my producer must just hate this part when I'm taking all, oh, adding more to these 45 minutes <laughs> to, uh, to, your, uh, to your subscribing in particular, sharing, subscribing. Uh, what was the other one? Lynn? Oh, gee. Oh, well. Do it all, guys. Enjoy. And uh, we'll hope to see you in the next one. In the meantime, have a great painting week. Sorting this out is one of the greatest joys you can have. Remember, the world is our oyster. God gives it to us. But it's for us to mine and to draw forth, to make, to make 10 times the talents we were given. So you're given nature. What are you making of it, right? Are you, are you, are you amplifying? Are you, now, I don't mean, don't be distorting nature. Don't be twisting nature. I'm talking about are you mining the beauty? Are you, you know, this is all about elevating the mind. So, but certainly elevating the mind. And this is an intellectual exercise. This isn't, this isn't pretty pretty. So get your mind working. Get your mind involved in all this sort of stuff, and I'll shut up now. All right. Take care. See you the next one.